Michael Corbett is Citigroup's CEO. He's going to join us right now to talk about all these market warning signs and much more. And Michael, it's great to see you this morning. Thank you. Good morning, Joe. Andrew, good morning. Great to be here. Hey, let's start, start off talking about the news of the morning with the okay. Treasury Secretary saying a weak dollar is okay. What, what do you think about that? Does that matter? Well, it, it matters, but I think it depends why it's a weak dollar. Mm -hmm. And I think there's probably two predominant schools of thought out there. One is, and I think we saw it in 2014, when the Fed was moving away from the quantitative easing towards the taper, towards rates high, uh, rising, and we saw the dollar actually perform exceedingly well. I think a little bit of the story today may be a Europe that's performed better than expectations in terms of growth, and therefore maybe giving the ECB the chance to start to renormalize monetary policy and move rates sooner in Europe than we'd expected. And people are also, by the way, saying that maybe Japan's not that far out there either. And so if the dollar's adjusting because of that, I think it's fine. But, but, but I think there's a finer point, which is, how do you feel, though, about the Treasury Secretary of the United States from a policy perspective, from a public perspective, saying aloud that the strategy of the country is to have a weaker dollar. What, is that, what does that mean and what does that say? He didn't say the strategy is. He said they, that they welcome a weaker dollar if it happens. Right? Welcome a weaker that. dollar. And again, if provided the weaker dollar is happening for the right reasons, makes manufacturing, makes exports, right. makes the U.S. economy more competitive. And we know during the stronger dollar, we saw the pains that it caused some of our companies in terms of their numbers and the foreign exchange and the, some of the frictions that came as part of that. The, the, the second piece of it, or the second side or the other side of the story potentially is, is it coming from fears of protectionism? Is it coming from fears of pending or looming trade wars? And I think that would be much more concerning if that's the reason the dollar's underperforming. So what do you think the proper answer is? How much I, I'm, more, I'm much more in the camp of the first. I think we've got to see, and we've got to see some of these trade talks play out further. Um, and, and we can talk a bit about trade, but uh, I'm much more of the camp that uh, uh, clearly, uh, to, to most people, certainly me, the growth coming out of Europe uh, and the breadth of that growth has been a very positive surprise. The president is headed here tonight, President Trump, and uh, that, that, that is the talk. It's the headline of uh, the Wall Street Journal today, and it's the talk on everybody's uh, lips here about what's going to happen with trade. What is the president going to say? What do you expect his message to Davos to be? I would expect it to be consistent with what he's been saying in the past, and that is that the administration is not anti-trade. It's anti-multilateral trade. It's pro-bilateral trade and what we've seen. I think we've seen it in NAFTA in terms of wanting to have very direct conversations rather maybe necessarily than, than Canada and Mexico as a union, but each bilaterally with those. I think we've, we've seen that as a precursor to conversations that are likely coming in China and other places. So in these, I don't view any one of these conversations as one-off. I view them as part of a broader series of conversations that are beginning and will take place over the next several months in terms of the U.S. direction of trade. A year ago here in Davos, people were pretty convinced that trade wars were looming just on the horizon. It, it, that hasn't played out in the last year, but we have seen moves this week to, to raise tariffs on things like solar panels and washing machines. Uh, we've seen the Bombardier situation where uh, the U.S. and Canada have strained relations over that and many other issues at this point. And we've seen talks about intellectual property with China. Do you, do you think that trade war is, is still still looming or you think that this is a smoother process where it's just a, a give and take along the way? I'm not a believer today in trade war. I think when you actually look at trade and look at trade imbalances, an example when we look at Mexico and we look at South Korea, you can specifically point to uh, very contained areas where those trade imbalances come from, i.e. electronics. And so when we look at the imbalance with Mexico today, the vast majority of the trade imbalance between Mexico and the U.S. comes as a, as a, as a component of auto imports, but it's realistically, it's not the assembly of those autos, it's the electronics. So 1994, NAFTA's written, electronics comprise 15% of the sticker price of an automobile. Right. Today, that's 35%. NAFTA didn't didn't anticipate break, that. Didn't so, anticipate that. Michael, is there room for the United States to be tougher with China? It, it, are, are we not justified in certain instances in being tougher than we've been in some prior administrations? I mean, they they do tend to if they get an edge, they're going going to exploit it, aren't they? I think there's a stance you, you can always be tougher. I think we need to be smart about where and where and how we use those powers or how we negotiate those. But I think you, you can always be tougher around certain aspects. And again, I, I don't think of this as being a broad brush. I think... Uh, but there are got to be instances. And, and we're 
you know, maybe we're not quite as hungry as, as you know, we have a lot, uh, you know, of, of bounty in this country. And obviously, we're, you know, there, there's going to be people that think some of what we have, they're going to you know, think I, they can take advantage of. You know, from my perspective, Joe, I see a lot of companies in the U.S., and they're hungry. Right. They're, they're well, I know they're hungry, but uh, I just, uh, you know, I don't want to be, you know, there's, there's the sense that maybe we're a patsy in certain instances where it's like, oh, you know, we're the biggest on the block, and, and we're not quite as... I don't know, we don't stand up for our side of things as much as we should. I mean, there's some room there, isn't there, without a, a trade war. There's somewhere in between, a so. trade war and that. I do. What, what are the implications uh, of this tax reform bill specifically on Citigroup? Literally, while we were speaking, uh, Starbucks just announced, by the way, that they're going to be giving uh, raises and bonuses to their own employees. By the way, we've had discussions about perhaps my cynicism or skepticism, but the political reality of, of why some of these institutions are doing this. Um, Starbucks obviously is antithetical in terms of the. So now you're not cynical. So in terms of the interest? political side Explain of it. Explain that to me. What, what are you saying exactly? Just I'm just saying that Howard out. Howard hold Schultz up. is a Democrat who's been critical of the president, and so to the extent that we've talked about whether companies so are trying is, to curry favor this is the, with the, the administration or Washington. They, yeah. I'm, I, no, by the way, maybe so. I'm. You know what it sounds like you're saying? If, if you, Howard does it, it's okay. No, I'm not saying That's that. That's what you're saying. I'm saying. I'm saying maybe I'm wrong. Virtue signaling. Save the video. Maybe I'm wrong. How about that? Is that? Is yes, that okay? We'll that. Well, let's ask Mike Corbett about what, what City's doing about all of this. Sure. So, uh, as we think of the benefits uh, or the, the outcomes of tax reform, really two things. One is the biggest benefit really comes from how it affects our clients, or in particular our U.S. clients, in terms of how they operate in the U.S. and how they operate around the world. And we think this is going to be a catalyst for spending, investment. I think people are underestimating the impact of repatriation and not just the money coming back, but the money moving around the world and how that's going to be put to work. Uh, what it means to our consumer bank and the consumer wallet and the fact that people are going to have a bit more in take home. And we've seen a consumer that's in pretty good shape. They've been engaged. You look at holiday season sales. And so all that's. You all want to announce positive. anything here, Michael, that you're doing? <laughs> Well, I think from a company perspective, we really get a benefit in, in two different ways. One, like everybody else, we benefit from a tax rate going from 35 to 21 percent. And banks are historically high taxpayers and city historically has been a high taxpayer. And we'll get the benefit uh, of that is right. we get to take more of our EBIT to net income. And the second piece is uh, as a legacy of the crisis, we had this large deferred yeah, tax did. asset, which was a tax credit from some of the losses we took during the crisis. And as adjustment to the reduction in taxes, that goes away. And we get a benefit from capital that actually right. gets released as a function of that and increased top line. What do you make of companies, including J.P. Morgan, we're going to talk to Jamie Dimon in a little bit, um, announcing plans or, or like what Starbucks just did or these other companies, including Comcast as well, of increasing either one-time bonuses, salaries or the like. Is that something that's going to happen at City? Yeah, you know, from our perspective, what we said, and we said on our earnings call a week or so ago, we're going to watch this unfold because we don't know what percentage of the tax decrease gets competed away. We don't know exactly what the needs of our customers and clients will be. But we've got plenty of capacity is, in terms of... Is the net operating losses that used to be so valuable, is that... Is, they're less valuable now, so you're less um, ready to do what J.P. Morgan did? Is that what... No, no. You know, when you look at... When you think about that, Joe, it's a, it's a, it's a trade, in essence, we would do all day long. We would much rather right. take the increase of net income from the reduction of the tax rates and give up the tax asset because net-net, it's a positive. And so we make a dollar, we give back 50 cents of it or whatever the math is. So net net, it's a positive. So we've got plenty of capacity to be able to support our customers and clients. And so we're going to see this unfold a little bit. And then, then we're going to react to it. you think you've got rank and file employees that are wondering where, where their bonus is? I mean, are, are they going to hear soon? They, you know, we, we, you know, we always pay competitively. But do you think we'll that, continue but, to pay but by the way, do you think that, that, that what's happened in the past month is going to put pressure on you and everybody else right. from just a competitive perspective, everybody, there's sort of a keeping up with the Joneses, right? If Comcast does it, then does Charter have to do it? If J.P. Morgan does it, does City have to do it? If Starbucks does it, does Dunkin' Donuts have to do it, right? And that's, that's and, and by the way, that's what you have to hope for. Um, yeah. from an economic perspective. And we've got to see. We've got to see more broadly. And again, we talked on the earnings call about right. we've got to watch the competition and see what, what of this actually 
uh, we get to utilize and, and right, what gets right. competed away. A couple quick questions on city. The stock buyback uh, yeah. that was very large. I think you bought down share count by about 7% just in the fourth quarter alone. I know you have to go back to the Fed to ask how much to do, but is that a continuing plan? How much do you plan to buy back if, if you get your druthers and the yeah. Fed allows you to do it? So in 2017, we returned about $17 billion to our shareholders in the form of dividend and buyback. We reduced share count by about 200 million shares on a base of about just under three billion mm -hmm. and as we say stated it's our intention to continue we uh, believe we've got the capital return capability of returning somewhere at least 20 billion in each of the next two years obviously subject to Fed approval, and again, like the other banks, we'll go through our CCAR submission, our stress testing submission process, and we'll get the feedback on that. But again, based on where we've said the amount of capital we need to run the firm, we're actually running at an excess to that today, and we've got significant capital generating cap capabilities. And very quickly, one thing the street would like to see is a bigger return on assets. It was 0.84% return on tangible common equity of 8.1%. How do you improve those numbers? Well, one is tax reform just improved the return on, on tangible common equity because that DTA was counted in our tangible common equity and now 22 billion of that's gone away. Okay. And what we said as a result of that going away, really very little of what we would call the good calories of capital left with it. So that was capital we were forced to hold and couldn't earn on. So we get an increase in terms of our numerator, in terms of earnings, and a decrease in terms of our denominator, in terms of capital. And we said we expect our returns to probably go up by about 200 basis points. Got to ask, wouldn't it be an interview without a Bitcoin question? Sure. Five years from now, if we're sitting here, we're we going to be talking about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin? I think we'll be talking about digital currencies. I'm not sure we'll be talking about Bitcoin. Do you own any? I do not. Would you own any? I would not. Because? I don't see it as a currency. I see it as a speculative instrument, uh, and I don't understand the underlying fundamentals of the investment. And like mm -hmm. Becky's friend, I don't invest in things I don't understand. Would you, could you, with a house, with, in, a, in a house, with a mouse? Anyway, Michael, thank you. Right. We appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.